So hello everyone and welcome to this scientific webinar titled Recommendations for Teachers from the Arc of Inquiry Project. My name is Marina Jimenez and I will moderate this session. With us today we have Lauren Bohatka and Nelis Birker. Uh, Mrs. Bohatka, she is a project officer, officer in the science unit at UNESCO Regional Bureau for Science and Culture in Europe based in Venice in Italy, which implements the Arc of Inquiry project on behalf of the organization. UNESCO is the work package leader for dissemination and exploitation of the project outcomes, including leading the organization of the project final conference and the drafting of the final recommendations and guidelines document. Mr. Riquet is a project specialist and trainer of pre-service and in-service teachers at the University of Tartu, specializing in trainings and project work uh, on the topic of inquiry-based science education and educational technology. The University of Tartu is the project coordinator for the Arc of Inquiry project and the work package leader for the methodology and instruments for evaluating the project. This webinar will present an overview of the project inquiry learning model and introduce how to access over 700 inquiry learning activities for classroom use on the project portal. Then they will go on to present the recommendations and guidelines of the project that are geared towards teachers as the main target audience. My colleague Noel with the Scientix account, she will be helping you with any technical problems you may encounter, so please write to her privately if you experience any difficulties in attending this session. Also, please remember to turn down your cameras on microphones. As always, at the end of the session, we will have 15 minutes in which we will be able to address the questions to our experts through the chat. We can still write them down and post them throughout the whole webinar and we'll be collecting them. And also remember that to receive a certificate, you will have to fill in our feedback survey, which will be shared to you again through the chat at the end of the session. And that is all from my side. I will leave the floor to the presenters and I hope you enjoy. Well, thank you, Marina, and also to Noel behind the scenes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Bohatka. Thank you very much, Marina, for the very kind introduction for myself uh, and Milis as well. Uh, I think Milis will come online with his camera uh, in just a few moments. I'm going to turn mine off uh, in just a minute and just a second so that we have a good reception for everybody. Uh, has been our experience in the past. Hello, Milis. Okay. So, okay. So, without any further ado, let's get started today. Okay, so moving uh, right ahead, I'm going to turn my camera off, as I said. Okay, fantastic. So what is the arc of inquiry? Well, uh, the idea for this project started from a need that was recognized in Europe to increase the interest of young people studying science and math. Uh, an EC-funded expert study found that one of the causes for this, among others, was in the way that science was being taught to our young Europeans. To counter that, inquiry-based learning practices were suggested to help motivate a deeper, more integrated understanding of science and intrinsic interest in the subject matter. Uh, alongside this idea of inquiry-based science education was also this concept of responsible research and innovation. Defined by the European Union as societal actors working together during the whole research and innovation process in order to better align both the process and its outcomes with the values, needs, and expectations of European society, RRI has also been identified to be a complement of inquiry learning that has been able to enrich the overall inquiry experience. And as within the Arc of Inquiry project, we have further identified this idea of RRI and uh, concept to also mean for us, meaning collaboration among peers, communication of the results of an inquiry activity, and also broader reflections about the inquiry process and its constitutive elements, the identification of explicit as well as implicit moral issues related to an inquiry, and recognition of the social context of inquiry learning. So the project itself is a teacher training project on inquiry-based science education in, in RRI, Responsive Research and Innovation, conducted over a four-year period starting in March 2014, and will be finishing up this next February. It is comprised of 13 partners across 12 countries, covering the full width and breadth of Europe. We also have now expanded our activities into Albania recently as well. It's funded by the EU's FP7 program and is coordinated by our friends at the University of Tartu in Estonia. 
The overall goal of the project is to create a new science classroom for Europe, which helps to build a scientifically literate and responsible society through inquiry-based science education and also through raising youth awareness to responsible research and innovation. Now, while the project is European in scope, the results of the project's activities and findings have much larger implications as they also help to address the UN Sustainable Development Goals that are part of the Agenda 2030. In particular, the project's inquiry model and the pedagogical scenarios help address SDG 4 on quality education by using relatable examples, collaboration, reflection, and dialogue as encapsulated in the orientation and discussion phases of the project's inquiry model. Uh, they also help to address SDG 5 and gender equality. And through the incorporation of RRI in the various inquiry learning activities themselves that pupils are participating in through the on project's online portal, uh, SDG 9 and industry innovation and infrastructure is also indirectly addressed. And you can also see on the right of this slide some of our very ambitious targets for engagement over the lifetime of the project. And uh, Milis and I are very pleased to say that now, with just maybe a few months remaining, we have already met or surpassed many of these uh, target goals uh, or are on track to do so within the end date of the project. So we're very proud uh, of that and reaching those high numbers. So what have we done so far? Um, well, uh, the project has been uh, composed into eight different work packages. And uh, our first work package has started with this idea of creating a pedagogical framework or inquiry learning model of the project. And Milis will present more on that momentarily. We've also collected over 700 different inquiry learning activities in all the different branches of STEM, from math to physics, chemistry, biology, disaster risk preparedness, et cetera, all for all learning levels and ages. We've also developed a strong community of teachers across Europe who are engaged in the project, and we hope you'll be interested in joining them, uh, as well as a supportive community of science centers and museums, research institutions with whom the teachers can collaborate. We've also developed a three-tiered training program for our teachers, which addresses teachers first as learners, uh, and then up to teachers as reflective practitioners. And we've undertaken six research studies throughout the lifetime of the project to evaluate the project's success and findings. And these are now available in a special issue of the iCase journal, Science Education International, Volume 28, Issue 4. Um, our project implementation has been very strong, conducted first in the pilot phase and now uh, finishing up our full implementation phase of the project, reaching well over 1,300 teachers and currently around 20,000 pupils and growing. And we've also taken under uh, numerous dissemination activities uh, and actions from presenting at conferences, producing a variety of online materials about the project, and also trying to keep our social media accounts quite active. And lastly, of course, the project management, which has been overseen by our Estonian friends, as mentioned earlier. Uh, now I'm going to hand the webinar over to Milis from the University of Tartu to share with you some more specific information on the Arc of Inquiry model uh, and the portal. So Milis, I hand it to you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, like you already heard, the first step of the project, or the, the first main focus of the project, was to develop a pedagogical framework that would support all these ambitious goals. And as we saw, that inquiry learning might be simply a way to engage students, but it's also, in addition to that, a very good, effective method to uh, raise awareness and actually also help with career planning by introducing and teaching the scientific method and the method of uh, how scientific discovery process works. So inside the classroom, we are dealing with students, pupils who actually deal with the same issues and problems that scientists do in a similar way that scientists approach these issues as well. So there's an aspect of career planning and raising awareness in that as well. But uh, if we look at how scientific discovery works or how inquiry activities are connected, uh, conducted within the classroom, we have to uh, approach it by following sort of a framework. Because inquiry learning is not a new thing. It's been around for, for decades now. It started in the 1950s in the United States. But uh, it has been practiced in many places, and it's quite common in a way. But to speak of a uniform inquiry model, that's something new. And for us, that was actually the first step. 
to make this sort of a model that uh, tries to encompass and use all the different previous approaches to inquiry as well. So what we did was a methodological, methodological literature review uh, by inspecting different articles and materials that deal with inquiry learning. And from that, we got information about what the inquiry phase is and what sort of inquiry cycle could be this unifying model for all these practices. And basically, we gathered information from 32 different articles, but, and we selected articles that uh, describe the process itself, because there were many articles that dealt with inquiry learning from different aspects, but these 32 articles dealt with the whole process, describing it from the beginning to the end. And these articles were reviewed um, with the goal in mind to describe different processes. So we eliminated uh, different repeating processes and dealt with the, the unique ones. And we discovered that essentially in all these articles, 11 different processes or phases of inquiry were described, which could also be uh, labeled into five sort of a bigger categories. So in the end, we finished with a result of five different main inquiry phases and a total of 11 sub-phases. So let's look at the model. At first, it might look quite confusing, but it's OK. We will go into detail a bit further. But what I want you to take from this image is the fact that these phases are not linear. This is a cycle, which means that different phases can be approached in different order. And sometimes it's reasonable to go back into a different phase to start over or to repeat the process while having more information. So if, for example, we look at this first step, the orientation phase. Let's say we are introduced to a theme, a topic, a subject, and we are guided towards making our questions or raising our own hypothesis. We can actually either move forward to experimentation or we can actually come back from that phase as well and revise our questions and revise our hypothesis and to start all over if we get more information along the process. And as you can see, the discussion phase is located to the side here, which means that actually this is not a phase per se. It's not one distinct piece. It's actually something that has to be there at every step of the process. Basically, in every phase, there's an aspect of discussion involved between the pupils themselves or between the pupil and the teacher, or even why not between teacher and different societal actors like scientists, parents, and so on. OK, let's uh, look at each phase a bit more in detail. Let's start with the orientation phase. Uh, traditionally, can be the first one, but like I said, these phases do not all have to be applied at once, and they can always be presented in a bit of a different order. But the classical way for conducting inquiry learning in a classroom usually starts with the orientation phase, or processes that can be described with the word orientation. In this phase, we're trying to engage pupils in a topic or try to um, get the basic knowledge about a subject or a problem that we will try to expand further, that we're going to investigate and uh, pursue in other phases, basically. So this is the background knowledge in a way. After we have gathered some necessary knowledge, we can start to expand upon it a bit more. And for that, uh, we can differentiate two sub-phases. In the conceptualization phase, we have the questioning sub-phase and hypothesis generation sub-phase. It's not important to always delve into both, but that's a very good thing that we can pick these pieces that our students, our pupils, need more guidance in. And we can always move from one phase to the other. So after we have understand understood the, the basis of the problem, we can start generating research questions based on that. 
And after we have developed our questions, we can start forming our hypothesis. Or we can start forming our hypothesis right away, provided that we already have necessary background knowledge and we are inquisitive enough so we can start right away. And that, in that case, we are hoping to have a hypothesis or several that we can later use in different phases so we can prove them or disprove them. And if necessary, we can go back to orientation phase, gather more background knowledge. If not, we can move forward. And if we move forward, then we notice that in the investigation phase, we actually have three sub-phases that can be differentiated. These are exploration, experimentation, and data interpretation. So, I think the main question here is, what is the difference between exploration and experimentation? The answer is quite simple. Exploration is uh, actually a way of um, conducting science in a way that it's more open-ended. We have a process for gathering data, for generating data, and we have a question to guide us. But at the same time, we are open to different solutions. While in the experimentation, we have a very certain experimentation in mind, we will conduct a certain experiment in order to prove or disprove a hypothesis. So you can see that one is more closely connected to the research question and the other is more closely connected to the hypothesis. In exploration, we can actually go back and form an hypothesis based on this exploration as well. So there's another example of how the cycle can be very, very different for different, different pupils. But in both cases, the final sub-phase in the investigation phase is the data interpretation. Basically, it means that in case of any experiment or any exploration activity, uh, we have some data that we have to interpret in some way. Basically, uh, ideally, this is the synthesis of new knowledge we will find out something new for us. In case of pupils, that will be uh, sometimes something that we already, as teachers, might know. But it's very important for the pupils to have it be sort of found out in their own base, in their own way. So they are actually sort of discovering something new for themselves. It might be common knowledge for us, but it, it's very important to live through the process and to see that something is actually valid, our hypothesis might be proven, but they are the ones that are proving it at the moment. So it is a moment of success as well. And actually, in this case, it's very important to make sure that people are aware that not all hypotheses and not all experiments are meant to be successful. The ideal effect is not to have a hypothesis that you have proven. It's also very good if you can disprove it using the scientific method. After we have interpreted our data, we are finally ready to reach some sort of conclusion. So, basically what we do in this phase is that we compare our data set to the data set of our, uh, our peers, or we can compare different data sets we have collected ourselves, and compare this data to our initial research question or hypothesis, and see whether it allows us to prove or disprove the hypothesis, or whether it offers some information about the research question. Have we gained some new insight, basically? Have we discovered something for ourselves? And like I said, the discussion phase is the fifth phase. That doesn't always happen to be a different phase, but it's something that should be always done alongside other phases. But there's also two different sub-phases we can differentiate within the discussion phase. And it's also uh, visible on the slide that we differentiate, and not only us, but uh, in different sources from all these articles we gathered, that there are actually two different types of discussion that is very, act uh, very, very um, common in inquiry learning. One of them is communication, the other is reflection. And the difference here is that with communication, we are actually using a very different set of skills than in reflection. In the communication, we are actually trying to convey our results, our findings, in a way that it's understandable by other pupils or, or the teacher. Basically, we're learning to present our findings. 
but reflection can be a much more complicated process. It can be a process of uh, describing your own experience or describing some tasks within the inquiry cycle. Basically, we're evaluating and finding meaning for the process, either for ourselves, like, for example, which part of the inquiry was difficult for me, or we're describing the process from the um, uh, viewpoint of conducting this uh, phase as well. We can uh, either focus on our own personal uh, preferences, difficulties, which, dif which is difficult for us, which is uh, complicated for us, which is easy for us, but we can also um, focus on the technical aspects. For example, um, a pupil can enjoy very much conducting the experiment, but maybe the peers can offer him or her feedback about how he or she actually might develop his or her skills within this frame. So this is the place for um, sort of social learning as well. We can communicate with others. We can learn about what we can learn about the inquiry as well. So this is very shortly put, the inquiry cycle. So this forms the pedagogical framework for our project alongside with many different guidelines produced for um, using different inquiry activities, for modifying them, for uh, involving aspects of RRI, which uh, could mean using different um, real-life examples, discussing the ethical implications of different research projects, or simply involving different societal actors, scientists, parents, or science centers and museums. Uh, this is something that we wanted to do with the project as well, because like science, it's not an isolated process. It's a social process with different different actors. So should be learning about science. And for offering uh, different types of activities to have as many different possible learning outcomes or learning scenarios, we collected um, these activities from many different sources. Uh, we had many other projects that have already ended or are continuing in another way that could offer us many useful activities. Because actually, this is a very common problem with different um, development projects in the field of education, that once they're over, they're over. So we try to give new life or a new meaning or to spread the word of different other projects as well. At the same time, we gained a lot of interesting activities, and we also benefited the goal, goals of these other projects, in a way. So basically, we tried to gather as much already produced materials as possible. And uh, this picture here represents uh, one project, in a way, that was already trying to collect many different activities from different sources. And in the example of this project, CoLab, um, it gathered many different virtual labs, distant labs, and activities based on them. So virtual lab is sort of simulation where we can conduct experiments using a computer-generated laboratory, in a way, so which allows us to conduct experiments that are otherwise unavailable for schools, either they're expensive, uh, use uh, too many materials, are dangerous to conduct. And in case of distant labs, we have labs present in different facilities all over all over the world, and pupils can use them through computer interface. For example, we might have measurement uh, tools in a lab uh, with a proper setup for measuring some sort of a um, value, and they can use them to the computer, but at the same time, they don't have access to these to this equipment themselves, but they can use it to long distance. So basically, we try to open up as many possibilities as possible. And all these activities were gathered into the Arcop Inquiry portal, which is available at the address you can see on this slide here, arcportal.eu. And in addition to the inquiry activities, which we have, like Lauren said already, uh, 700 more, we have different sections in the platform as well, because the activities are definitely not the most important part of inquiry learning. For us, the 
most important part is actually either the community or the methodological guidelines that support teachers or the, or the community. So we had four main sections for the portal that we wanted to have. The first one was the teacher's toolbox. This is the collection of all different materials, guidelines, and for example, scenarios for uh, uh, modifying the inquiry activities to suit the needs of your class, your pupils, or for example, different language requirements, how to approach translating activities. Do you need to even translate activities? Maybe sometimes you don't need to translate them at all. Some words in science are very, very uh, common in all languages, very similar. So sometimes you can use a virtual lab without actually speaking the language of the laboratory. So in the teacher's toolbox, we have all different support materials. And this section of the um, platform is available for all users. You can go there and start exploring the teacher's toolbox, while other sections uh, require for you to register for the platform user. In the community section, there's a, a selection of groups, and groups can be created by teachers. So this is a way for um, sort of um, organizing your workload as a teacher. You can group different pupils together. You can have them be um, sort of grouped by uh, different skill levels, different um, topics that might interest them. So it's, it's very flexible in that way. You can suggest activities in these groups, and you can have discussions in these groups as well. So it's, it's sort of a helping mechanism for conducting uh, inquiry learning, but also conducting inquiry learning uh, in, a, in a case that you can do it in the classroom. Maybe some pupils can do it independently. Maybe more talented, uh, inquisitive pupils want to conduct their own experiments. In that case, the teacher can still somewhat support them, even without actually being in the same room while they conduct their experiments. So it's, it's very flexible in that way. The fourth section, the inquiry passport. This is basically the user profile in a way. But instead of just um, containing data about your user, like your username or email, this is actually something that we view as sort of an inquiry passport. So this is sort of a portfolio in a way, because it collects all different activities and different findings you might have uh, sort of presented during conducting these experiments. So uh, in effect, you can go back and look at different activities that you have done and see what you have learned from them. And also, uh, this is a way we could implement a sort of an award system. Since we wanted uh, pupils to be motivated and get some sort of a not a benefit, but sort of a reward for conducting their inquiry activities, we found a way to automate this process as well. Teachers are, of course, the best candidates for rewarding their pupils and motivating them and telling them where to develop further. But this is a small mechanism for rewarding pupils in a way. But we'll talk about, about that a bit more later. So. Like I mentioned, the teacher toolbox is a collection of all the pedagogical scenarios, and they can be for different topics, like I said, for adapting the activities or improving them, or even uh, getting uh, assistance in designing their own activities. And also, another important aspect is that when evaluating inquiry activities, a very good way to do it is by using a formative assessment. So it's very difficult to grade pupils based on their inquiry skills. And it's also very difficult for teachers to actually uh, say, what is an inquiry skill? So it houses all the different materials that we produced for helping the teachers to sort of differentiate uh, inquiry skills from general skills or different subject-related skills, and how to assess them and give feedback based on these skills as well. So this is sort of a guideline or guide for teachers for how to give feedback on inquiry learning as well, which is actually probably the most important part of the project, because inquiry learning might not be new for some teachers, but a sort of a framework for assessing inquiry skills is a quite, quite novel concept.
but of course some teachers have it all figured out so uh, that's why we always invite teachers to share their own experience and share their own tools and instruments and support materials for teachers about inquiry learning okay so uh, for adding your own tools you can always contact your local coordinator for some countries it means that you have a very certain person you can address and you can discuss about adding new activities for other countries uh, this means that you can contact either me or Lauren to find a way to share your own experience okay uh, inquiry activities like we mentioned we have very different inquiry activities from many different subject domains and actually not only stem domains we focused in the project on the stem domains but we try to develop the platform in a way that it's open for different other domains as well so actually you can find some other activities in there as well and when adding your own activities you are not only limited to stem domains you can actually conduct research in for example um, Romanian language or arts and crafts it's very open in that way and uh, to navigate in all these different activities um, there's a quite thorough search engine for choosing between different activities you can use it to uh, find the activity that you need and you can filter these activities by either using the DAC cloud which gives you access to the most popular activities activities that have um, most different variations and the topics that have most different activities but you can also use search functions like choosing a language an age group but also focusing on different inquiry phases for example if you feel that your pupils need the most support uh, like say in the conclusion phase you can search activities based on emphasis of the phase so you can choose activity where pupils can develop most in that phase so let's move on in the community page like I said there's a possibility for teachers to create different groups and at the moment we have around 90 different active groups which are usually based on um, languages or different schools so it's usually um, written in the group name as well and we invite uh, teachers who create new groups to do it as well to make sure that pupils are able to find the right group to make uh, make it clear in the naming as well which group which teacher which country we're dealing with but also pupils can be added to the group by the teacher as well so there's two options pupils can navigate themselves to the group or teachers can add them as well and like I said these groups allow us to communicate with our pupils to suggest them activities to view their progress we can see which pupils have already finished their activities uh, which feedback uh, we can give them and which uh, feedback could they give to their peers because it also offers the possibility to um, sort of assess your peers work to um, sort of see what others have done and give feedback to them and to give feedback to the teacher as well from the viewpoint of a bystander and uh, <clears throat> yes the focus here is on the peer feedback but it also makes things easier for the teacher it's it's a comfortable place to give feedback in this way and in the inquiry passport page here we have examples of these badges that I described earlier these sort of a automatic small rewards that are given out and you can see different examples on this slide as well for example like I mentioned we have uh, opened the platform up for possibilities of adding different domains and different activities from different domains you can see for example the badge for completing three different uh, activities from the fields of arts and crafts or for example astrology or for example geology but also following the um, award system that's uh, described in the uh, teacher toolbox you can actually go a bit further and submit your people's work for uh, assessment by a council of experts in a way in collaboration with national coordinators 
and different sort of high ranking awards can be given out as well, which are very individual, not automatic. They have to be applied for. But all information about applying for these awards is present in the teacher's toolbox. So now I'm going to give the floor back to Lorraine, who's going to talk about what we project and what are recommendations for the teachers and other societal actors. Thank you very much, Milith. Uh, for, yeah, as you just said, for the last few minutes of our webinar today, we wanted to share with you uh, some of the findings that are of our project and the resulting recommendations and guidelines that have come out of it. These are recently published online on the project website for a variety of target audiences, from teachers to policymakers, science centers, and even to pupils and parents. And today we're going to just kind of walk you through those that are specific for teachers, as we feel this probably best represents uh, our audience today. So the final recommendations from this project were structured around the question, how to foster successful inquiry learning in the science classroom, which as we saw in the beginning of the presentation was the impetus behind getting more students interested in furthering their science and math educations and hopefully careers. And the answer that we came up with, if you will, was by rethinking science teaching using responsible research and innovation. We have broken our findings down into three groups or key messages, which loosely translate to applying the right, uh, in quotations, if you will, with the right tools, a supportive community, and ideas. Each key message is then supported by a series of rationales or supporting statements to better describe and also illustrate where this finding has come from, followed by specific recommendations for each of the project's target audiences. So we'll go into a little bit more detail. Uh, for the first key message, uh, we've, we've said that the right tools can better enable teachers to utilize inquiry-based learning with their pupils. And to support this notion, we've identified six supporting statements or rationales to back that up. One is following an inquiry model, such as that is presented to you in the project by me and this today, uh, helps teachers structure classroom activities while leaving room for flexibility uh, which, as needed, which is very important, by using both formal and informal learning environments to help promote inquiry learning and RRI. Involving pupils and evaluation of inquiry activities better engages them in the inquiry learning process. Pedagogical scenarios help teachers maintain an active role as designers of inquiry learning activities. The use of an award system is motivating for teachers and pupils alike, but works best when integrated into existing contests and communities. And lastly, inquiry activities themselves engage pupils while promoting learning of 21st century skills. So for more details on each of these uh, six rationales, if you will, that back up this key message, you can consult the final document. But for the interest of the short time you're given today, we're going to move directly into the, the takeaways, the recommendations for teachers that are based on this key message and these six rationales. So takeaways, uh, te takeaways for teachers from this first key message. Uh, well, the findings from the Arc of Inquiry Project would like to suggest uh, that teachers take advantage of the inquiry-based learning framework developed in the Arc of Inquiry project and design or redesign as needed your existing learning activities accordingly. You may be using another inquiry-based learning model already, which is great, but do see how it compares to what we've presented to you today and see if there's room for further improvement. If you haven't been using uh, such a model yet, please do read up on all the information we've provided and see if it is something that could work for you in your classroom. Share the model with your pupils and use the framework for inquiry proficiency. Getting your pupils to understand the process you are taking them through is really a crucial element we found for helping them understand the scientific process, but also giving them a sense of ownership of what they are doing by entrusting them with the logic you are promoting as their teacher. To design your lesson plans in a way that allows you to take your students out of the formal classroom setting to an informal learning environment. Informal learning environments are great for reinforcing what you are teaching in the classroom or to help present new ideas, too. A change of scenery is always great to help ideas stick in the students' minds that they will have that place as a new reference for them. And to use formative evaluation instruments to encourage progressive inquiry and to gain insight into the skills, skill sets of your pupils. A number of evaluation tools and instruments are provided on the Arc, by the Arc of Inquiry project on our website and on our portal and in a variety of European languages. So please do take a look and see what you can take away from them. 
We also suggest for teachers to consider incorporating and adapting one or more of the six arc of inquiry pedagogical scenarios and adapt them to your pupils and your curriculum needs. These six scenarios are, are great and really a key added value of what the arc of inquiry model uh, provides and they will help you as teachers basically adapt what you are already doing um, and adapt your materials that we are providing with you to tailor and really fit the needs of your classroom and your pupils. Uh, we also encourage teachers to recognize the potential of using an award system, such as the one we presented here, but also others, for motivating pupils and engage in existing contests. This was originally at the heart of the project to design an award system to help motivate pupils, and we did find it to be very motivating for pupils, and we have some great success stories. Um, but we did find that for it to work, you need to also make time within your lessons to support using such award systems and contests. And also look for support of your school directors. Using existing contests and award programs uh, may help make your life a little bit easier, but you don't need to feel like you need to go it alone. Talk to your principal or your school director to see if you can buddy up with other teachers in your school or school system even to make the competition a bit more meaningful uh, and have a bit more recognition for your pupils that engage with it. And lastly, under this first key message of um, you having the right tools available for teachers, we do encourage teachers to recognize the potential of inquiry activities for teaching these all-important 21st century skills. Um, if you've not been familiar with this term, the idea is that these are often the softer skills that are taught alongside the hard math and sciences, such as presentation skills, learning to communicate with your peers, work together in teams, leadership, etc. Um, the list is long, but the potential is really high when you engage with inquiry activities. So we really do encourage you to, 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 to go for it. The second key message that had come out of the Arc of Inquiry Project activities is that a supportive community can provide teachers with the training and resources needed to successfully use inquiry learning in the classroom. And this has been supported by four different uh, rationales or statements. The first being that collaboration with different actors, such as researchers, parents, or peers, helps promote RRI and inquiry learning in the classroom. The second being that teachers need to experience inquiry learning themselves during teacher training in order to design and implement inquiry best in the classroom. The idea of a whole school training approach of teachers fosters collaboration and greater understanding of how to use it in the classroom. And also approaching teachers as designers of activities enables the flexibility needed to apply inquiry learning across different contexts and cultures. And again, the support and illustrations and best practices for all of these different um, these uh, four rationales are available in our final recommendations document. And we're going to, again, skip ahead to the takeaways for teachers from these particular uh, rationales. So the first idea we want, we're hoping for teachers to take away is, is that you try to incorporate and adapt one or more of the six arc of uh, inquiry pedagogical scenarios. Am I reading the rest? Oops, sorry, I'm reading the wrong slide. Apologies. OK, so here we go. Seeking out opportunities. So we do encourage teachers to seek out opportunities to engage more with other actors, both inside and outside the classroom. And this is really important, not just for the project, uh, this project, but in general, because teachers, as, as you well know, you are not alone. There are many other actors out there, uh, science censors, researchers, parents, policymakers, who are just as eager as you are to teach our children. Uh, and it helps a lot in the inquiry learning process, too. We also suggest for you to recognize and recall the importance of the inquiry learning process that you experienced in your own training uh, in the same way that your pupils are experiencing it in your own classroom. This came about as we found that having teachers undertake and participate in inquiry learning themselves, uh, it helped them better understand how to help their pupils in the learning processes when that time came. We also suggest that you encourage your fellow teachers to engage in whole school training programs. Uh, this helps you support each other and share success stories of other schools that participated in such professional development programs. And this kind of localized reinforcement has, has been proven, uh, really been proven in our experience. Many of our most successful classroom experiences in the project have come from schools that embrace this style of teacher training, so we very much encourage it. And lastly, we would like to remember that you are designers of learning activities, to use your existing materials and scenarios as a starting point and tailor your activities accordingly to meet your needs. While you may have some activities that are mandated by your curriculum to be done in a certain way, the Argue of Inquiry project has given you some tools to help you focus your efforts in a way that suits your needs best. You have the possibility and the capacity to do so, as no one knows your classroom better than you. So we really encourage our teachers to remember that and to try to do, use the materials we provided as much as you can to adapt to what you need to do. And the third key message that has come out of this uh, project, and the final one, is about ideas. 
uh, and such that concepts like responsible research and innovation are effective in enriching the air-cooling learning process. So what does that mean? Um, the seven uh, rationales that support this have uh, include also that RI helps teachers translate important materials, important matters, excuse me, in their into their classroom materials. It provides a framework within which the research process, its ethical, social dimension, and sustainability can be suitably discussed. The effectiveness of RI is enhanced when teachers give responsibility for discussions and ownership of the inquiry learning process during its different stages. Adequate flexibility is needed in the classroom for an effective application of the RRI concept during inquiry learning lessons. We also have recognized that RRI is a very important tool for engaging girls in the science classroom, so please do read more on that. Uh, and when discussion of RRI is promoted outside the classroom, increases the staying power of inquiry learning. We touched upon that earlier. And also that the RRI concept favors people's orientation towards scientific jobs and careers. Now, the takeaways from uh, this key message include that uh, we suggest teachers to try to incorporate, as best you can, time for reflection, communication, and discussion in your lessons as often as possible and guide your pupils in their discussions of real-world challenges to facilitate their identification of solutions. This is really at the heart of an RRI approach and really cannot be underestimated, um, the power of adding this into your normal lesson plan and routine. We also suggest that you familiarize yourself with the many engaging inquiry experiments on the Arc of Inquiry portal from an RRI perspective in order to actively promote discussions with your pupils on ethics, society, sustainability during the lesson. Uh, the activities are all there, so please make use of them. We also encourage you to encourage your pupils to take the lead in making meaningful decisions in all phases of an inquiry activity. Again, we return to this idea of ownership of their learning process by your pupils. We really have some wonderful examples in the recommendations document of how pupils really became engaged uh, in other ways, perhaps maybe mundane topics, um, because teachers were able to hand over to them some of the decisions for the learning process, and that really helped them to engage them in the, during the, the learning uh, activity. And of course, try to maximize your flexibility in planning inquiry lessons. We know this isn't always easy, but as there are curriculum requirements for a reason after all, but uh, there is a w always a way to try to incorporate some adaptations to your particular needs and what you do, and we encourage you to do so. We also encourage you to work to create a class culture that is conducive to equal participation of both girls and boys. Here we return to the idea of gender equality in the classroom. Unconsciously, many of us promote our own ingrained gender stereotypes when teaching or discussing um, what we consider as maybe more appealing to girls or boys. But by using the inquiry-based learning model in RRI, this can be substantially reduced just by adapting some of your techniques. The Arc of Inquiry project also has developed a wonderful cheat sheet, if you will, for teachers with some ideas, uh, some tested and proven ideas of how to better engage not just girls, but girls and boys equally in the classroom, which is also available on our website and in the Arc portal and in a variety of European languages. We also encourage teachers to use informal learning activities to promote RRI beyond the classroom setting. Here we also return to the idea of using informal learning settings, but this time to help reinforce some of the ideas of RRI, such as discussions on ethics and policy and civic engagement um, that can all be greatly enhanced when discussed outside the classroom in real world settings. And lastly, we encourage you to foster discussions about science, technology, careers when people are working on RRI-based inquiry activities, as this is one of the ultimate end goals of getting more people uh, interested in studying STEM subjects, that they will eventually pursue careers in these fields and help keep Europe on the cutting edge of technology and innovation. So that brings us to the end of what Milis and I have planned for you uh, today. So thank you very much for your attention uh, and listening. And uh, I think at this point, uh, either Noelle or Marina will summarize some uh, some uh, some of the questions that have come up along the along the throughout the discussion. So the floor is open. The questions Thanks. they were posted in the chat. So I'm gonna go through them chronologically, uh, so you got, guys ha can see how to respond. So the first one was from Lydia Nassaro, and um, in relation to the scientific methods that you were explaining at the first at the beginning of the webinar, she says uh, this is a similar way to the classical scientific method. Do these steps apply to students of all ages, or what can be changed? OK. Uh, actually, the similarity to the classical scientific method is not a coincidence. It's actually a synthesis of different approaches that we can use scientific method in the school, in the classroom. So the similarity is there intentionally. But uh, it's very important to differentiate these phases and how you approach them. 
So, for example, with the younger pupils, we have to offer more support uh, in conducting these phases. Uh, so technically, we're not speaking about age. We're actually speaking about area of responsibility. How much uh, autonomy and how much responsibly, uh, responsibility do pupils have themselves? So in a way, we can actually conduct uh, the same experiment with young pupils and pupils that are a bit older <clears throat> and focus on different things. For example, with younger pupils, we can uh, conduct experiments step by step and ask ask them about their opinions in different phases, but overall give a lot of the information um, for them to use and to uh, synthesize something new out of that information. But for older pupils, we can already give them a lot of freedom. We can intentionally leave some information out, have them find their own information about this topic, or for example, in planning an experiment, we can have them choose their own tools, their own materials for conducting that experiment. We might even not tell them what could the experiment be. We can at first see what types of experiments could they propose for researching this topic, this problem. So we're basically playing with responsibility and autonomy. Uh, it can even be done with uh, the simplest of processes, for example, discussion. For younger pupils, they can discuss about impact, how they felt about activity, which was difficult for them, which was good, what did they learn. But for uh, older pupils, we have the opportunity to um, bring in many different uh, widespread topics about, uh, from the um, whatever might be actually be uh, related to the topic. For example, we could um, see different uh, news stories that might be connected to this research topic in a way, so we can go broader. We don't have to focus on the pupil, we can focus on what's going on in the world in a way. So we have a lot of room to play with this sort of responsibility and autonomy. So I hope that answers the question in a way. The second one that I gathered is from Hannah Dudic, and she asked, how can science teachers from Ukraine get involved in the Arc of Inquiry project? Okay, I'm going to leave that for you, Lauren. <laughs> well, first of all, we would be thrilled to have some teachers from Ukraine uh, jumping, coming on board with us. Um, we currently do not have a coordinator for Ukraine yet uh, because it's not one of the partner 12 partner countries of the project, but you can still be involved. Um, all you have to do is go to the website, and from there you can find a link from the portal. It's also on your screen right now. If you go to arcportal.eu, uh, everyone can go and sign up directly on the portal. Once you have done so, you would contact your local coordinator, since there's not one for Ukraine. You can just contact myself or Milis. Our information is available there uh, on the website as well. And we will convert your account from that of a pupil to a teacher. And then you'll have full access to all of the activities that are on board, uh, the 700 activities. Um, I don't believe we have any in Ukrainian language at the moment, uh, to the best of my knowledge. But there, one of the great things, as Milis mentioned, about the portal is that there are, it is open for teachers to be able to add new activities. So if you have a great inquiry activity uh, in Ukrainian, in Serbian, in Croatian, Albanian, um, and there's many, many uh, nationalities are joining us today, um, you are able to, to go ahead and to add that yourself too. If it's something that you've developed yourself uh, or something you've been using and already tested in the classroom, because that is the idea, as Milis explained, behind uh, the project and the portal is that all of the activities that are online right now have already been tested. They've already been tried by teachers just like yourself. So you are not guinea pigs in any way, shape, or form. We want to keep that going. So if you have a good, tried, and true tested activity, please do feel free to upload it. Uh, I believe there was also another question, if I'm going to jump ahead here, um, Marina, about trainings as well, too. Um, we are actively looking for additional funds to do additional trainings. At the moment, there are some teacher training resources available. Uh, on the Arc of Inquiry homepage. They are there under web-based materials. So if you get some more detailed information about um, the different phases of the inquiry model, a lot of the things that Milis took you through today, is a lot of that is there and available. Um, if we can find funds, uh, we would be happy to do and expand to other countries as well. In particular, I know UNESCO, through our office here uh, based in Venice, our target area is 
countries of Southeastern Europe, which I know many of you are coming from. So we are actively looking. We were able to do a training recently last month in Albania, and there is a, no, a coordinator for Albania we are pleased to share. Um, so that information, if it's not on our website now, it's going to be up soon. But, um, but we're very much hoping to do more. But there are materials there existing already. And the, on the portals, Mila said, evaluation tools, instruments, pedagogical scenarios to help you adapt the activities, the checklist for teachers on how to better encourage girls, a lot of that is already there. So we very much uh, encourage you to use what we have available. That was a great answer because you already covered another question about the extension to the other European countries. So Southeastern Europe is kind of the focus. And there was another one from Enrica. Um, she was interested in knowing if the materials are for exper experimental sciences or also for mathematics. And there was a lot of interest in knowing which specific topics or subjects were covered through these um, materials. Well, uh, our activities cover many different domains from the STEM fields, which means that we focused on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, actually. so. Uh, these topics are in there for sure, and we have quite a selection of them. Uh, we, when we consider different domains that are not actually part of the STEM domains, for example, like arts, languages, uh, there's quite a narrow selection, but there still might be some. But uh, in case of these classical science subjects like physics, chemistry, biology, geography, there's quite a selection. And as well, mathematics, engineering, these are present. Any comments on the chat? Um, maybe I should just read it out loud. It's from Gulistan Koch, and it says, hello again. I'm not a teacher, but I work at an NGO in the education department. I'm currently writing and implementing workshops and academic support programs for children. Um, the children I work with are Syrian refugees and Turkish local children in poor districts. Um, while I was writing the workshops for science education, I tried to use the inquiry-based learning process, but while we implement the programs, we need to strengthen the children's life skills and broaden their horizons that they can explore something as well. For example, for biology, start with questions. They have answers, but they have questions. Everything goes well. But oh, wait. Okay. Uh, what I take from this question, firstly, is the part of um, focusing on life skills and broadening horizons as well. And for this, actually, this sort of a, a approach from the viewpoint of RRI, which is Responsible Research and Innovation, could help out a bit. Because that's actually the connection that we try to have for these activities, that there is some sort of theme that connects to real life, real life skills, and broadens their horizons in a way as well. So uh, there might be some useful resources, some useful activities for developing these skills as well. But as always, this requires a bit more from the teacher. The teacher must be, avail uh, must be available and willing to commit to discussing these topics as well, in addition to conducting the main activity or the inquiry. So this uh, sort of uh, different hints at these topics are uh, woven into many different activities. So they can be found when you look through the activities. Sometimes it's very, very well explained. Sometimes it's just. Uh, given hints at it, but there is something in that regard. And the other part of the question, we see that actually challenges might arise from the um, inquiry skills or the lack thereof. So uh, that's why I would recommend to uh, use the search function and try to find at first the activities where the proficiency level of the activity is rather low. So we can start uh, practicing this scientific method with a lot more support. So we can sort of get the basic idea of every step and to develop our skills from the very beginning, sort of uh, making our first steps. And these activities that are marked with this basic proficiency level in the search engine as well, uh, these are very good activities for starting inquiry learning. And as our pupils gain skills, we can move on to advanced activities. So there's actually three levels that we differentiate, uh, basic, novice, and advanced. And if we're dealing with learning the basic inquiry skills, it's good to start at the basic level and then move on as we gather knowledge. 
about the process and the basic inquiry skills. And more information about these skills and how to uh, sort of assess them, it's also present in the teacher's toolbox. So I also invite you to sort of read through the materials and browse and use what you can because there is, at least I'm positive about uh, it, that there's something useful for every teacher, uh, dep not depending on the proficiency level of the pupils. But if you look through them, you can surely find something to support these pupils as well, who just are beginning to gather their inquiry skills. Yeah, I hope I that, that. Uh, explained the question a bit. Maybe I can also add in too here to what Milis just said. I, I also echo um, to try to use uh, looking at also the pedagogical scenarios that deal with adjusting proficiency level. Overcome. There's also is one on overcoming language and social cultural barriers, whether it's applicable in your case or not. You have to see. But if I understand correctly, you're also based in Turkey, uh, Gulistan, um, and if that's the case. Um, we also do have a Turkish partner on board the project, and uh, I'm sure he would be thrilled to, for you to get in touch with him and also see if a way to help engage and collaborate with them too. So uh, his contact information is also available for, for all of the partners is available on our website. So please do consider that as well. So for today, since we already expired the time that we had available, um, so thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Thank you to the speakers. It was a great presentation. Um, this has been the last scientific webinar of the year. Um, remember that the presentation will be available on the scientific website. And if you want to receive a certificate, please fill in the Cyber Monkey um, questionnaire that my colleague Noel has just posted on the chat. So again, thanks a lot for presenting the Arc of Inquiry projects. And thank you, everyone, for everyone who was present today. And from the scientific team and from myself, just to have a happy holiday. Bye.